Hey everybody, welcome to Obscurities and Miniatures. It is, at least the day that this is filmed, another Friday, which means it is time once more for another Obscurity in Literature. And this is a piece of literature, if you want to call a bunch of pretty pictures, and we do mean pretty pictures, in a book with barely any text, uh, literature. I, I will take that definition. But this one was so obscure, it actually took me a while to remember what the heck it was. Um, Terra Battle. Terra Battle was a name that I could not remember. I kept thinking of everything, Triple Triad, Triad Battle, Tetra Battle, Tetra Wars. I, 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 I could not remember what this was called for the life of me. And I apologize to everybody involved. But then I realized, you know what? I knew it was a Mistwalker game. Mistwalker uh, being a developmental studio that has really kind of carved their own path when it comes to making traditional Japanese role-playing games, if you will. Uh, that's always been their little niche, but they've been very funky and kind of decisive in how people have um, come to terms or appreciated them at the time of their release. Now, one thing that I've always felt, whatever you may feel about the gameplay of all the games that they have made, is their artwork has been top friggin' notch. Uh, the one game that I really remember my eyes being drawn to was, um, what was it, The Last Story, I believe it was called, on the Wii. And it was one of the very few traditional, in a sense, uh, Japanese role-playing games that was released on the system. And a lot of my attention was because of the artwork, which was done, in fact, by the artist of Terra Battle, and that is one Kimihiko Fujisaka. Now, the style, as I started to piece all of the puzzle back together about who is who and what they've been up to, is also an artist that I've been kind of enjoying um, on the Dragon Guard Dragon Dragoon games that Squared put out um, with certain people that would go on to make other very big name games for Square, like Nier, for example. But anyways, we're not going to talk about all that stuff. We're going to talk about Terra Battle. Terra Battle was the first in a trilogy of games that were eventually released. Um, and they were really different. They were very different at the time, and everything about them was different. The style, the look, how they played, it just wasn't like everything else. And you could say that basically about everything that Mistwalker has done. Thankfully, their books here are a little bit better faring. Now, the unfortunate and the most hardest thing about this is that it that's it. I remember seeing the stuff from the later games. This is only Terra Battle. There was a Terra Battle 2. It didn't do very well, eventually hit its end of service, and then a few years later, I want to say we had Terra Battle Wars, that ended up dying, and I want to say that the original Terra Battle was the one that lasted the longest. Unfortunately, this is kind of early in its development, and despite the thickness of the book, um, yeah, there's just so much stuff that came later. So, I'm going the wrong way, but that's okay, because I wanted to double-check the date on it, 2015. And immediately... The artwork just instantly reminded me of the last story, um, especially the style of the swords. Um, the artist Kimihiko, Kimihiko Fujisaka was very um, stylized in their approach to weaponry and embellishments in the artwork. And that's actually one of the cool things. For those of you who are even more illiterate in Japanese than I am, um, one of the nice things is upon opening the book up, you've got everything listed out both in English and Japanese. So kind of a plus there. And the artwork is just, just really, really nice. If you're like me and you like seeing kind of behind the scenes and how things look prior to the finished pieces, well, there is plenty of that here. The book itself is broken down into the main subsections, you know, the heroes, the monsters, NPCs, but then they take it a little bit further, and I'll show you in a second. 
So if you're familiar with like the Kazuma Kaneko books, it's kind of similar in that regard. You've got just these big full page spreads. One of the nice things is everything is in both English and Japanese. You have, even though it's kind of tiny on the screen right now, and we'll see if I can get it in a better little focus, you've got their names in Japanese and in English, and then a quick, you know, whatever their title is, but then in the corner as well, it's got the English and Japanese again. <coughs> so you can start to see some of the more interesting patterns, and Kazuma Kaneko is, is a name that often makes me think of his work whenever I look at this in terms of just some of the weirdness and that's especially apparent when you start getting into some of the technology and some of the other races like the stone folk which were quite different you'll also notice that there are plenty of lizards that's something that I'm always commenting on with various games and it is always nice to see more of But again, the sad thing is, this is just the first book, and only book, and unfortunately some of the real crazy stuff in the second game, I mean, you can find it on the internet right now, who knows how long that'll last, but if you're like me and you like to have a physical copy of that kind of stuff, you're kind of out of luck, unfortunately. I mean, if you guys have any leads, I don't think um, the artist here has done a whole lot of self-published stuff in like the Dojin world. A lot of these are the more upgraded forms, if I'm remembering. Some of them look familiar. But um, what was interesting about the game, from what I remember, is that as you progressed and evolved characters, they kind of like got their humanity or whatever, you know, their physical selves replaced with like technology and stuff, which was kind of interesting. Looks like the dude on the cover artwork there. That's more the kind of stuff I remember. You also see a lot more variety in skin tones and body types. Not even for just the humans. Again, some of just the weirdness makes me think of Kaneko's work. And the various floaty shapes. And jumping over to the monster section. Yeah, it's with the stone folk. I feel like you really start to see that real distinct otherworldliness to them. The lizard folk, beast folk. Kind of reminds me of like Yoshida and Minaba's stuff, like from Final Fantasy Nine era. Some of the more technological enemies. Again, giving off some like Nirasawa vibes almost. Some fun bioorganic stuff. I kind of remember like they had like airships everywhere. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. There definitely was a lot of technology in it from what I remember. So then, in the last and most interesting section of the book, in my opinion, is you start to see a bunch of the early drafts of the characters that were in the game at the time. You've got the line work for some of them. Some poses were used, some were not. You can start to see where you have, like, just the more weirdness starting to pop in as well. And that loss of <laughs> what looked like normal human limbs. And there's a ton of it too. There is definitely a lot of variety in terms of how the characters look. 
And again, to me, that was like the main attraction of the game. I can't remember much about it other than the fact that I really, really like the designs. But like most online service games, you know, everything must come to an end at some point. But I'm just bummed about that. It has a very interesting sword. You're in a giant flower. I think it was like a blind guy that had some kind of like a little sensor thing. You can see here he has legs. And then in the upgraded one, we've gone the neck route. Again, why have legs when you can have weird rocky stone stuff, right? Definitely some weird ones in here. And we even get some of the NPC stuff as well as some of the backgrounds and scenery. It was definitely a unique look. Some of the early sketches for the various races. And then, as a bit of a surprise, in the back, there's actually an interview, but you'll notice that it is in both English and Japanese, so that's kind of a cool touch as well. You don't see that often, and this is a Famitsu book. And I mean, I can't think of many things that have been published in English from Famitsu directly, so that's kind of a surprise and kind of interesting. But again, it just pains me because there were so many neat designs. I mean, that's not like to discredit the quality of this book, but... I don't know, now I'm thinking that like, I'm gonna have to go hunt down the Dragon Guard, Dragon Dragoon materials as well, just to satisfy that desire for more of uh, Mr. Fujisaka Kimihiko's artwork. So, uh, we'll be searching and I hear my daughter screeching at me that there's food. So that is probably my cue to go tell her to shush up. And with that said then, this has been High Lord Tamberlane with Obscurities and Miniatures saying thanks for watching and we'll see you back here soon. Bye-bye.